Welcome to the 369th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have a really big show for you today. We're going to be talking about an update from Insteon, new processors for the IoT from ARM, wireless charging, which is actually, I think, maybe becoming a thing. Amazon has a billion-dollar industrial innovation fund that they've started. We also have some news about Madam A, that's Amazon's digital assistant, and funding announcements in the energy awareness space. Wise has yet another new product. We've got a potential prototype Pixel watch to talk about and an update on Sigfox. Plus, Kevin has a review of the AirThings Wave Pollution. We'll talk about indoor air quality as well. And our guest this week is William Sundblatt, who is the CEO of Odin Technologies. We're going to be talking about using IoT to help with sustainability efforts and recycling materials in industrial manufacturing. We're also going to hear from our sponsor, Impinge, talking about IoT and retail. And before we do any of that, let us hear from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Influx Data. Increasingly, time series data is all around us. It's in the cloud as applications and services scale out. It's in the IoT as more and more devices come online. And sensor data is time series data. That's where InfluxDB comes into play. InfluxDB is the open source time series platform made for developers to build real-time applications quickly and at scale. It's programmable and performant with a common API, and it gives you high granularity, high scale, and high availability. Get started for free and learn more at www.influxdata.com. Okay, we can't start this show without an update from our favorite folks at Insteon. This feels so long ago now, but really it was only last week that we, I guess last week in a couple of days, that Insteon servers shut down, leaving a bunch of people with non-working apps and hubs, and frankly, they felt a little panicked. They should, because there was no news from the company for a good couple days, if not a week. Yeah, like 10 days. People started noticing this on Friday the 15th, but Insteon didn't actually publish anything until, I'm going to say Wednesday night, the 20th, when they put up a notice on their website. (laughs) And they also sent out the next day an email to many of their customers explaining that they had been sold. Well, okay, here, let's explain what's happening. First off, Insteon finally put up a note on its website and said, hey, basically the pandemic did us in. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. So they basically blamed the pandemic. They said that the company tried to find a buyer in November 2021 that would continue to invest in new products and technology. They had a bunch of people interested. They thought they would have a sale in March, but the sale didn't happen. And then it assigned a financial services firm in March to to basically sell any of the remaining assets. Hang on a second, because the pandemic, definitely a valid issue and challenge. Okay, many companies have dealt with it. This is really money needed to run their cloud services for the Insteon service. And I guess I didn't pay attention over the pandemic if they had problems keeping inventory of products in stock. So maybe that was part of it. But it's not like they were debuting new products, you know, every week, like like a Wise or something. If you read between the lines, here's what probably happened. This guy, Rob Lilliness, through Richmond Capital Partners, invested $7.3 million in 2017 in Insteon, right? And they had the smart home site where they sold Insteon products. And what probably happened is after five years, basically, he didn't see what he wanted to see in terms of investment returns. Like he didn't see a way out. He didn't see the sales growth. I mean, that's five years is a pretty reasonable amount of time to look at something and be like, oh, yeah, I agree. I I don't love this trajectory. At that point, you could try to find new investors. It sounds like that was not going to be an option because it just wasn't doing well. 
And I, I can see that. It's yet had a core base of users who freaking loved it. Right. Yes. I mean, like, I can't tell you how many times I get emails from people who are like, what about Insteon? Every time I complain about a smart home thing that doesn't work. And I get it. It has a proprietary wireless technology that people that that was very solid and low latency. It was good. Great local control as well. You had a lot of local control options until you pulled in voice assistants or other external services. And they actually worked with some of these external. So they worked with Google yep. Home. They worked with uh, Amazon's Manoma A. I don't think they did a great job branching out between beyond the smart home loyalists. And I think that's a it's a very active market, as we know, but it's not a huge market. So they never were able to materialize what they were doing to the mainstream. They also didn't sell like home builders or anyone on this. And so I think what happened is they just kind of stayed stuck where they used to be. And that's not something you want to keep putting money into, right? If you're an investor. Right. And I guess they weren't profitable enough. I don't know there. So here's my issue. Sales go wonky all the time. It's unfortunate. You always have to have a plan B. And I feel like the plan B in this case was basically run out of money. And I feel like you should probably try to work your deals and keep enough money in escrow to have your business in a cloud-based business like this operate for at least two months. Sure, people would have been equally pissed about it shutting down, but they would have had a little bit more time to find a solution that works for them as opposed to like, oh my gosh, it's the difference between being told they're not going to renew your lease, but you've got 30 days to find a new place, which is still stressful. And, yeah, but, and they didn't even try to like reach out to users of their services to say, hey, we're in trouble. We're going to have to sell unless unless we get enough people who are willing to pay, say, $5 a month or something to keep the servers alive. That didn't happen. And and I'm sure there's a lot of moving parts at the time, and maybe they didn't have time to do that or just didn't want to or couldn't. I can appreciate that. But it would have been at least a better option than nothing. Yeah. So anyway, so now they've assigned a company to sell the assets. We talked last week about how we think this is unlikely to do what people might hope. But, you know, we'll keep our eyes open. A lot of competing platforms have picked up uh, where Insteon has left off saying, hey, if you're in Home Assistant, you know, we've got an integration or whatever it might be, Hoobs or so on and so forth. So there are, and, and we wrote an article on what those options might be. We talked about it last week as well on the podcast. So it's not a complete dead end, but you got to really be one of those uber passionate Insteon people to really stick with it now at this point. Yes. And I don't think... I mean, there's no growth here. There's, I mean, it's only, it's all going to be on you, the uber passionate people. Yeah, I think you're just prolonging the inevitable, to be honest. But that's just my opinion. So this will give you an orderly transition to another platform. I also will say that I do think if it materializes like we hope, some of the basic features associated with Matter would help in this situation. Not that Insteon devices will suddenly become Matter compliant because they won't, but you know. Going forward, Matter has the local control, the device identification, and data models that allow, you know, something to talk to Madam A or I was going to say Cortana. <laughs> wow. 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 Who? <laughs> going all the way back to 2017. Sorry, Madam A or Hey G or Siri. Does It just doesn't, it doesn't set Siri off when I say her name, does it? I, I, it doesn't set my stuff off, but then again, who knows? Let me know, y'all. Yeah, I don't people mean to will do let that us too. know. Absolutely. Yes. They'll be like, ah, Stacy. Okay. So that's the Insteon news. Let's move into, oh, it's my favorite topic, y'all. It's got to be chips. That's right. Potato chips, IoT chips, edge computing chips, ARM chips. ARM this week has launched new processors for the IoT and given us an update on a program that it developed about six months ago to make building chips easier. So let's talk about it. On the actual new silicon, well, it's not silicon because ARM licenses its IP cores to other people and then they build the silicon. But latest cores, it has updated the Cortex M line. The M stands for microcontrollers, which are these tiny, tiny chips that are in the IoT all over the place. But they're not as tiny anymore. ARM has launched the Cortex M85. This is a new. MCU design. It's designed for AI 
jobs. So it's an MCU plus the ethos AI processor, AI kind of functionality core. I, I don't know what to call this. Um, so it'll be able to do things like voice recognition, like phrase recognition, not just like a wake word, which is pretty exciting. And they'll do it at low power and it'll run all that on the edge. Woo. So that's the new design there. They also gave us an update on their total solutions for IoT, which is just a really boring name. But this is what they yeah. launched six <laughs> months ago. And it has a bunch of things. First thing, <laughs> it's almost like a plug and play type of architecture for IoT devices. Yes. So part of this is the ARM virtual hardware. That's the cloud service for testing ARM devices without actually having to build it in physical silicon. That's pretty cool. No, it's not just cool. That's huge. Yes. If you're a device maker, it's not huge for you and for me, perhaps. But if you're a device maker, just think back, what was it, two weeks ago, we said that um, new chip samples couldn't get out for product testing and development because, because of the pandemic and supply chain and all that. You don't need a product sample, a physical one, if you can simulate one with software. So you could start building a device and testing your code against a new chip without having the chip by using the ARM virtual hardware service. Yes. I was really excited about this six months ago. The M85 <laughs> will be part of this. No, no, it's true. That also includes something called Core Stone. It's basically ARM has pre-designed a bunch of, it's. It, they've placed their cores in almost a complete chip for you. And they've, they've pre-done this and pre-certified it. And so basically, if you pick one of the Core Stone designs, it's kind of like when you go to a home builder and you just pick a, a floor plan, basically. And then you can still tweak it but the tweaks are smaller and you don't have to do as much work. So two new devices they have is the Corestone 310 that does voice recognition and the Corestone 1000, which is massive for cloud native edge devices. And that's for gateways and that sort of thing. So those exist. And the Corestone 310 will go in smart speakers, thermostats, possibly factory robots, any of which factory robots seem weird because factories are so noisy. So I don't see voice control doing a yeah, lot there, but sure. Not a good Go ahead, case. Uh, and that 310 design does use the Cortex M85 core. Ta-da. So you've got voice recognition on the edge built into the... Exactly. Yeah. And it's local, y'all, which yep. means it doesn't have to connect to the internet. So you could tell the... I guess you could program a robot to stop at the sound of screaming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just read a mystery novel where someone was killed by a factory automation robot. It Rather was, dark. Uh, yeah, it was nefarious. There, but, but you know, but hey. oh hey, that would work. Okay, uh, the Core Stone One Thousand for the Edge Native Cloud Native Edge devices is a Cortex A design. So that's their their like the same thing they use in smartphones and other things. It's their more powerful processing family. So that's basically anything that needs machine learning at the edge and we'll run Linux and blah, blah, blah. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited that ARM's continuing with this program, that it's adding new things to this program, and that so far people are really, it seems like it's doing something for ARM. So good yeah. for them. Okay. Let's talk about wireless charging. This will be the year. Actually, next year is going to be the year. Oh. So- Belkin has done a deal with YCharge, which is an Israeli startup that basically lets you beam one watt of power across your home. We actually, a couple weeks ago, had the CEO of Asia, which is a company that just got FCC approval to beam five watts of power across your home. Asia has a deal with Arcos, which is a French wearables and smart devices companies. And next year, we'll see wirelessly powered devices from Arcos. Uh, this one, this announcement is less power. YCharge has a deal with Belkin, which, you know, they make lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> they make chargers for phones and wearables and a lot of computer peripherals, as well as some smart home things. I think this is, it's good for Belkin. I, I kind of wish I would see this partnership with, I'll call it a, a more pure smart home brand, but but that's okay. We got to start somewhere. I would love to see it like my, you know, how you have your Bluetooth mice and keyboards. I would sure. love to see something like this there because it's it feels like it's a stable device. It doesn't need a lot of power right away, like a fan or something. It's just constant power draw. Charging at one watt continuously is not going to, 
that seems like a good use case for something like that, right? That's the thing. The promise of wireless charging has gone all the way to electric vehicles, right? Where you need a lot of watts all at once. And this is not that. People even scaled down and said, oh, my smartphone, I can wirelessly charge it, but it's got to be on a charger and it might be able to get 10, 15 watts max. I mean, that's even pushing it. Most wireless is probably like 7.5. So this is one watt. So you got to throw all that out the window. And the use cases would might be wireless sensors, door locks, wearables. wearables. Exactly. What's going to be happening here is like, obviously, you use your phone and you stick it on a charger, right? Overnight or for however long. And you don't want to wait for it to charge at one watt. But for a device that doesn't consume as much power, like a wearable device or your doorbell, it could just constantly, it's basically trickle charging. Imagine it trickle charging, just no right. wires. And I, I think that's a really compelling use case. And TV I'm excited remotes. to see it. Yeah. There's a company called Guru Wireless that is also doing over-the-air wireless power charging. And they pitched me children's toys that never need a battery change. I honestly, as a parent, when my batteries went out of a children's toy, it was kind of like the best part of my day. But that's okay. Time to go. Time to get rid of that toy. You're like, oh, that toy's tired. It needs to go <laughs> sleep for a while. So they're looking at possibly putting forth one watt of power across 10 feet. Yes. You would have a, a device in probably each room of your home. I was going to say probably a bunch of devices, depending yeah. on how they look. I, I don't know if I'll let them in my home, but yeah, uh, you'd have like a, a one for each room and whatever small power consuming device that's in there could be recharged through this. Now, obviously it's going to require different, possibly different chips, wiring, It'll require different chips. I know that the Asia folks, you need a chip in their transmitter, and then you need the chip inside the device. Eventually, Asia's plan is to work with like a, a router maker, and then you would have hmm. the charging just embedded in some basic devices that are plugged in. So it might be I, a router, it might be a television. Yeah. Things that are always powered in, plugged in, that makes sense to me. For the edge devices, though, I'm expecting some type of coil wire that's not in there now. Edge devices, like the receiving devices? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to have, yeah, this is not going to be like backwards compatible with your existing no. stuff. Which is fine because a lot of these things, maybe not a thermostat, but a lot of like a wearable or something like that, you change out every three years or so, two years. Right. Right. You change things out a lot. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about Amazon's Industrial Innovation Fund, because holy cow, Amazon said last Thursday that they are going to invest a billion dollars in industrial innovation. This is supply chain, fulfillment, logistics, and anything else that they think might work for Amazon's to deliver faster delivery. <laughs> so they announced this fund, and they also said that they had invested in five companies so far. Uh, I'm just going to run through them just because I think they're kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Module, I'm not even going to tell you how it's spelled. It's just crazy. They're developing wearable safety technology aimed at reducing workplace injuries. Amazon will love this because apparently they report the most workplace injuries. Vimon is developing a computer vision and AI product for inventory management. There's a company called Agility Robots. They're doing a bipedal walking robot that is kind of cool. I have no idea if that's going to... So like an assistance type of robot. Yeah, but I mean... Not the walks. scary kind. Yeah, It walks. It might be scary. You never know. Biotic Hive. This is an autonomous robotic solution that can adapt to existing shelving racks and boxes in warehouse and can go from floor to ceiling. This is cool because you don't have to build your warehouse around the robot like most of these do. It will adapt to your existing warehouse. And then Mantis Robotics... This is a really young company. It was only founded in 2020, and they're developing a tactile robotic arm that uses sensor technologies to work alongside people. That's pretty vague, but I'm betting one of those sensors yeah. is going to be radar to make sure it doesn't whack people and can stop really easily when it detects people near it. Unless it's supposed to. Right. Unless we're back to those murderous <laughs> industrial robots, <laughs> which I'm really hoping we aren't. Don't want. Okay. So... Basically, Amazon says that they're going to focus on all stages of companies, early stage, more established. They're not going to target a specific number of companies. And 
they're going to invest all around the world. So if you have an industrial company that sounds cool and seems like they're really into robotics and computer vision, now you can call on Amazon. Yay. And speaking of Amazon, they're not just giving a billion dollars to firms that need the money for investment purposes. They are giving all of their users something today. Ooh, what do I get? Well, it depends on what you have. <laughs> but what everybody will get is person and package detection announcements. It is available now for all Ring video doorbells, and it will be coming... This is an interesting list. It will be coming to the Abode, IOTA, and Outdoor Cameras. And here's the kicker. Wait for it. I'm waiting. The Google Nest Cam, the <gasps> Nest Cam with floodlight, and the Nest Doorbell. Oh. What? So when they detect packages, they'll tell Google will actually speak to Amazon and tell it to tell it's me. Inter- maybe that's a matter thing. I have no idea. But No, there's no video component to matter. Oh, that's true. This yeah. is just, Man. huh? But All right, it doesn't cool. matter how they're doing it. They're doing it. That's pretty cool. It's very interesting to see that. And then, of course, once you have those package and person detection as trigger events, you can set up automations in your Madam A app to maybe turn on the light if it's a nighttime delivery or something like that. So you'll have uh, various ways to automate that any way you see fit. And for folks who make cameras, they can now access the Object Detection Sensor API, uh, which is what's being used for all of this magic. So I'll just point out, because we we mentioned Matter, this is why I think that matter is too little too late. Not that I wanted to do more because then it would be even later. But like this sort of functionality is still going to require developers. It's not going to be built in at that base level that matter is going to be talking about. And so on one hand, yay. On the other hand, the cooler features that are coming out are not going to be things that you can do with matter. That's just my... I'm going to agree to disagree on one small portion of that. Okay, do it. Okay. You're right. I mean, I do think it is a little too little too late. But if Matter did support, say, uh, video cameras and could make an API like Amazon has done for its works with Madam A certified cameras, instead of a camera maker having to use Amazon's API to do this and then maybe use a Google API if they came out with one and maybe a HomeKit API if they came out with one to work all this magic just using one singular matter API would actually be so much better for everybody. Yeah. I I mean, and I know that's not the state of the real world right now. I get that, but it could and probably should have been. Well, yeah, we won't poo poo matter for a while. We're going to wait on that until it's actually out. Okay. Other news. Sense closed $105 million in a series C round of funding and you're like, what, Stacy? Who the heck is Sense? I know, I know. Oh, you do. Tell me. Aren't they the company that makes the real time home energy device a couple years back, where you hook it up to your electrical panel and it uses algorithms to determine what device is using how much energy? Yes, it is. Plus, Yay, I got in, one. In addition to that physical hardware, they also license their machine learning algorithms to other companies. So they have some of their AI on Landis Gear smart meters. They have it on electric panels from Schneider Electric. And this is pretty cool because I do, I mean, again, since started out with energy conservation as its goal, like you tell people what they're doing in their home and they'll reduce their energy use. But what's happening now is, as I've said before so many times, is resiliency and basically more being more efficient about how you use energy in your home is going to be the name of the game. So the data that Sense and the machine learning algorithms that Sense can develop could be used for things like making more proactive electrical panels that like when they're like, oh, you know what? It's the middle of the night. This is a great time to charge the electric car because nothing else is happening. Or, hey, we have 200 amps that we can use in this house and that's it. How can we allocate it over the devices that require if they were all running at once, you know, 260 amps, which is not too far fetched as we add things like electric vehicles, Uh, We're putting in more electric stoves. We're putting in heat pumps in more places. And those are all big consumers of power. 
So I think it's a compelling kind of marker for energy awareness is going and making the electric grid smarter is really a thing that is happening. So go sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Time for wise. (laughs) Time for wise. Kevin, you go. (laughs) Okay. So as of now, you can order the wise cam version three garage door controller. So I thought originally this was a garage door opener, which it is, but notice wise cam is in the product name. That's because wise is using a camera to open or close your garage door, which is unlike say the one that I use. Uh, it's got a, mine uses a magnetic sensor. Some other devices use a tilt sensor and so on. This uses a camera to monitor the garage door opening closing and you can open and close it remotely you can view what's in the garage if the door is open etc it is 39.99 you slap a qr code on your garage door and that's how the camera knows your garage door is closed it's cheap it's an interesting approach by using a camera i don't know that i want that but some people might have exotic cars and they want to keep an eye on their camera and monitor the garage door as well so there you go The controller is the new device, and you plug the controller, which costs $40, into the camera, which I believe is about $30 or $35. They may have done it. They're selling the Wisecam version 3 and the controller bundle for $40. If you just need the door controller, or maybe you already have a Wisecam, it's $19. Oh, well, there we go. Oh, I see that. Yeah, even cheaper. Okay. Now, I did see that it wasn't compatible with all of the garage door openers out there. Yeah, they have a compatibility link to see uh, on the site. So before you buy it, you should definitely check. Because it says it's not going to work with uh, the garage door openers made by the Chamberlain Group, which Mm -hmm. those are LiftMaster, Chamberlain, and Craftsman brands. I know that's like most of the garage doors out there in the world. So It's probably fairly limited, but I think check... Yeah, Obviously check. check before you buy it. Yeah. Especially if you want this funky camera thing. If you could do like their pan cam, it might be interesting because you could, but then I guess it wouldn't because it wouldn't be looking all the time for the QR code. Never mind. Okay. Yeah. Moving right along. Guess what got left at a bar? Not me. Nope. Two engineers from Alphabet walked into a bar and left their Pixel Watch. Hmm. <laughs> Ars Technica is reporting that someone on a Reddit found a Pixel Watch. And the prototype version that they found, it's round. It's not a rounded square. Um, It's a round thing with a crown. Digital crown. (laughs) A digital Mm -hmm. crown. And it has a bezel. People who hate bezels are going to hate this watch. And it's kind of puffy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looks like a fat air tag. But, you know, it might, I mean, it's a prototype. So, you know, and it doesn't work. So no one knows actually. Well, yeah, we can say it's a prototype, but um, Google I.O. is next month. So I suspect they're going to show at least the design, the real design. And I don't anticipate at this point in time, it's going to be that far from what we're seeing. The backside looks like a heart rate monitor, an ECG sensor. Um, there's proprietary watch bands based on this particular prototype. Um, you know, you're a Fitbit user. You've had many Fitbits. I mean, new hardware alone isn't going to cut it for you. I mean, it's really going to be, I think, the software and the sensors, right? Since Alphabet acquired Fitbit, we've been waiting a long time for some sort of integration. I mean, I certainly don't want Wear OS, but I, I'm curious <laughs> yeah. to see... I mean, Apple's done a really good job tying its watch to its phone. Such a good job. And as a former Pixel user, I would be really interested in something that could take advantage of my phone in a similar way, right? So Mm -hmm. we'll see. I always soon, so we'll stay tuned. Here's a quick update for everybody, because I realized we put it in the newsletter, but we don't actually talk about it on the show. And some of y'all may not get the newsletter and might be wondering, hey, What happened to Sigfox, that low-power wide-area network company over in France that went into receivership a while back? Well, a company called Unabiz, it's based in Singapore, it's an IoT company, they purchased it. They're the new owner of Sigfox, and they spent around 25 million euros, according to Enterprise IoT Insights, which has been like the place to follow this story. 
And they won, there were like nine bidders, but only four were super credible. Unibiz actually had an issue because the French government was like, we don't want a foreign owned company coming in and taking this. But the management team at Sigfox and the employees really wanted Unibiz to win. So they told the government and the government was like, okay, fine. So they let Unibiz win. And Unibiz will now own the primary technology com- company, which is Sigfox SA. And then they also will own the Sigfox France network operator. So, yay. Yeah. It says here the U.S. business has been placed into bankruptcy. Yeah. They didn't, well, they didn't have a lot of stuff here. No, no. And good news for the employees. Um, Unibiz has committed to keeping 110 out of 174 of the French employees. Yes. And good news for everyone. Henry Bong, co-founder and co-chief executive at Unibiz, says that the new Sigfox is going to, quote, reinvent itself and collaborate with other IoT communication technologies, and that they're going to strive towards the convergence of LP WAN, which I think means mm. we could see maybe Unibiz has a big LoRaWAN business, so maybe we'll see Sigfox adopt LoRaWAN. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. All right. Now, let's do a quick review. Not too long here, but Air Things Wave Pollution. Kevin, you tried it. I have. I've been using this for two weeks, um, partially because it takes one week to calibrate the sensors. This is a $199.99 product that monitors air quality in your home, specifically temperature, humidity, and particulate matter. So not much in terms of the sensors, because quite honestly, humidity and temperature are I would say table stakes on a lot of sensors these days. Uh, so the price seems a little high to me. They do make a beefier model that includes radon, carbon dioxide, air pressure, et cetera. That's a hundred dollars more. So if anybody's interested, I'd probably look at that device. But if you have a smart home, I don't know that I would look at this device at all. Um, it's a very nice piece of hardware. It runs on six AA batteries for about two years uh, or a USB C cord that you plug into the wall. It's got an e-ink display to show your current air quality. It's very nice, but it really doesn't do anything with the data. That's my biggest issue with this. I can see historical data. I I tested it and feel it's very accurate. I mean, I I had to like sand plywood in my house just to kick up dust, and I saw the particulate matter reading spike. So I trust it. The humidity and temperature match what my Ecobee says. But all that data doesn't go anywhere. The only integrations it has is if this, then that. And they say, Madam A and Google, but really all you can do if you link it is to ask your smart speaker to check the CO2 levels or the humidity in a room. There's no, you can't use that as a trigger event for any automations, not through those integrations anyway. And frankly, I never got the Google integration working and PC Mag had the same issue with the more expensive one. So it's a little sketchy right there. If you just want to monitor and have historical data, yeah, it'll do that. But I want more. So this is definitely a pass for me. Yeah. Plus, I feel like I get a lot of the similar data. I have an aware glow. It was only 90 bucks or maybe it was 100 bucks and I got it on sale. I can't remember. And it's an internal automation that just basically it has a plug in it. So it'll turn on an air purifier when it's needed. But that sounds like a much more functional device, and it actually measures VOCs and particulate. Oh, no, it doesn't measure particulate matter. Never mind. It measures humidity, temperature, VOCs, and carbon dioxide, but not particulate matter. Well, that's still more than this measures and does more because it can enable smart actions yeah. to happen. Well, particulate matter has been a big deal because of the smoke and the wildfires. We're worried about particulate matter there. And then also with viruses and that sort of thing, people are looking for measurements for those, even though they're small, they're much smaller than the average 2.5 PM that gets measured by these things. Right. And I did get notifications when the PM levels were too high and I used IFT to have a light bulb turn red when, when they spike too high. But that's just, hey, just letting you know something's going on. Well, you still have to do something. I'd rather have the house do something. Yeah, me too. Well, thanks for getting, you know, the potential for lung cancer to test this out. Yay, Kevin. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Okay. We're going to have to fire you from the podcast if you can't not cough. 
I know. Life is hard. <laughs> I got the black lungs, Stacy. Okay. <laughs> Workman's comp. There. Oh, oh no. Okay. Come back, Kevin. <laughs> come back. All right. I think we're done with the news for this week, but let's move on to the Internet of Things podcast hotline. This is the segment of the show where we take questions from y'all and try to answer them. If you have a question for us, give us a call at 512-623-7424. And you still have time up until April 30th at midnight Eastern to win this month's prize. And this month's prize is a Nest Doorbell Camp. You will be entered to win that if you call us before April 30th at midnight Eastern. Okay, this week's question actually comes to us from Chris. Let's hear it. Hi, Kevin and Stacey. This is Chris. Quick question about HomeKit. Lately, I've been having problems with my home hubs going into standby. Uh, two Apple TV 4s and one HomePod Mini. And the HomePod Mini goes into standby and none of the Apple TVs take over. They all stay in standby mode. The only way to get it up and running is to give my router a reboot and have everything reconnect. I've tried resetting the HomePod twice and one of the Apple TVs once, and it's still a problem. All of them are updated to 15.4.1. Thanks a lot. Okay. So as a HomeKit user, I have not experienced this, but apparently a lot of people have because we did some research and found going back several years now, people seeing their HomeKit hub in standby mode and wondering what to do. So since I couldn't replicate this, Chris, I can't say this will definitely fix your problem, but I can give you some tips and some suggestions that were provided that have helped other people. Apple itself actually has a support page that says if your home hub isn't working as expected, and a home hub can be a HomePod, HomePod Mini, Apple TV 4K, Apple TV HD, or iPad, they say make sure it's up to date. Okay, that makes sense. Make sure you've got the latest version of iOS. Make sure that the user signed into iCloud is the primary home app user, not an invited user. So that's definitely something worth checking because it could easily be somebody else signed into iCloud on that device that's not the primary home app user. So I would check that. They also say to turn on iCloud keychain and two-factor authentication for your Apple ID and make sure it's connected to Wi-Fi, which I'm sure it is. And I, I don't think that's the issue. One other person had a very interesting little tidbit that I'll mention. He had said his device was in standby instead of connected. And his hub was an Apple TV, I should specify, but this would apply to whatever you use for a home hub. He went into his Apple TV settings, not in his on his iPhone, but in the Apple TV itself. He went to the HomeKit settings. At the bottom of the settings, he disabled the Apple TV as the home hub and then re-enabled it. So maybe with multiple home hubs, that kind of kicks it into being the primary one and keeps it into connected mode. That got him out of standby for good on an Apple TV. So I wish we had more. Again, I wasn't able to replicate this. I've never had this problem. I guess I should consider myself lucky. Yes, I think you should. Okay, Chris, we hope that helps, actually. And if you want, try this out and see and report back Let to us. Because, y'all... Sometimes we can replicate and try stuff out on our own, and sometimes we just have to resort to Googling, which kind of makes us feel like, are we doing you that service? I don't know. So give us feedback. Okay. So remember, if you would like to call us, or Chris, if you want to call us back and let us know if that worked, give us a call at 512-623-7424, and you will be entered to win this month's prize drawing of a Nest doorbell that, yes, I have tested. It is a former review unit, but it's lovely. That concludes this portion of the show. Now, please stay tuned for our guest, William Sunblett, who is the CEO of Odin Technologies. We're going to be talking about how to use data to make your manufacturing more efficient and how to increase sustainability. But before that, we have a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Impinge. 
We are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Impinge, and today I've got Gaylene Meyer here to talk to us about RFID in retail. So Gaylene, why don't you tell me a little bit about Impinge and where you work with retailers on IoT solutions? Well, some people define the Internet of Things as a network of powered electronic devices. Impinge expands the Internet of Things to include everything. In the retail industry, I'm talking about things like the running shoes you order online to pick up in store, your basket of items taken through a self-checkout system, or the pallets and packages moving through a retail supply chain. The Impinge platform lays a foundation for developing IoT solutions that connect physical items to the cloud. Using RainRFID, the Impinge platform delivers the identity, location, and authenticity about everything a business needs to manage. RainRFID is a global standard that provides a unique identifier for any item. Impinge invents and builds RainRFID products like the tiny chips that power a RainRFID tag, the readers that wirelessly identify tagged items, and software like algorithms and APIs that our partners use to build and operate RainRFID solutions. The retail industry is the first industry to widely adopt RainRFID for counting and keeping track of inventory. You know, RainRFID disrupted the practice of individually counting inventory one by one. Because RainRFID can identify items without direct line of sight and identify up to a thousand items simultaneously, it's the perfect technology for quickly and accurately counting retail inventory. In fact, retailers report 99% inventory accuracy after deploying RainRFID. Do retailers think of a system that uses RFID for inventory tracking as an IoT system, though? In a recent survey of retail executives, 95% reported believing that RFID will be a key component of their digital transformation. These past few years of global supply chain disruptions have been really hard on retailers. Without accurate inventory data, they operate in the dark. I'll give you some examples. Fashion retailer Zara uses Rain RFID in an integrated stock management system that allows the fulfillment of online orders from the store. This provides customers with an enhanced service while keeping all stock available to purchase at all times. Sportswear company Nike has tagged 100% of their footwear and 75% of their apparel, enabling them to see over 1 billion units at 99.99% readability across all their stores. And what other IoT applications are you seeing being adopted in retail? We see retailers looking to Rain RFID so to support sustainability and recycling programs that reduce overproduction of products that end up in waste. And Rain RFID is also used to authenticate products for brand protection. What we see is that once retailers have adopted Rain RFID for inventory management, then the next step is to extend their investment into other areas. Self-checkout, loss prevention, and store operation applications are top on the list. So where would our listeners go to learn more about Impinge? You can visit our website at www.impinge.com, that's I-M-P-I-N-J, and take a look at our blog. We work with a global ecosystem of partners who innovate and deploy IoT solutions across a range of industries. And there you'll find stories about how Impinge, together with our partners, is connecting everything to the IoT. Hey everyone, we are back with the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and today's guest is Willem Sundblad, who is the CEO and co-founder of Odin Technologies. Hello, Willem. How are you today? Doing great. How are you? Excellent. So I am really excited about this because unlike a lot of people, I get really excited about industrial IoT. And I love <laughs> talking to companies who are helping make manufacturing cleaner, smoother, and hopefully a little bit better. So to kick us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about Odin and what it does? Absolutely. And I'll start by saying probably the best part of my job is that, you know, we hire people from within the industry, but also from outside of the industry. It might be software engineers from places like Uber, Google, Facebook, and bringing them into manufacturing and seeing how excited they get about solving manufacturing problems too, is probably the best part of my job. Because it is a really awesome place where you can have a really meaningful impact and also help manufacturers now that they are facing some pretty big challenges. But back to what we concretely do, we help manufacturers analyze and optimize their production. And right now, for most people, that really means increasing their output to meet the excess demand that they're seeing. And so step one in that is taking the data that exists in many different silos and making it useful, accessible, and accurate so that people can discover problems faster and solve problems faster. The last part there in solving problems faster 
really comes into more advanced analytics that is tailored to specific use cases where one example I'd love to bring up because I think it's it's a really cool and useful one is predictive quality and specifically using predictive quality in order to both decrease crap but also to increase output because that's something that we're seeing across most of our industries right now. And we'll talk about some of those challenges, but I just want to clarify for people what you're doing. So y'all have got a SaaS model. You're bringing in people's OT data. You're combining it with their IT data to, to get them this quality score. But can you help me understand how this gets deployed and if it's custom for each customer? So it is configured and then we work in, so configured but not customized. And we focus on specific industries. So right now, that includes paper and pulp, plastics, extrusion and injection molding, compounding, and also some chemicals. And so you can think of it as every factory has a slightly different starting point from a digital maturity. The starting point might be on what I call guided analytics or more curated insights. So helping people find the most important problems to solve where if you're just looking at a standard OEE dashboard, it might be hard to know where to look. Whereas we have machine learning models that help people find the fastest way to impact. As an example, we might serve up to them these five product and line combinations is where you have the highest variance. And if you run things this way, or if you change the operating instructions this way, you can increase your output with 10%. So that's a fairly low lift in terms of advanced analytics, but very high value in terms of just getting started. But then, you know, you might look at that curated dashboard and see, I want to increase my output. And here are the opportunities on quality, on performance and utilization. And then if you pull on each thread, you can go deeper and deeper into more and more advanced use cases that helps the people solve problems and make better decisions in real time. So if you pull on the quality thread, as an example, you might first go into automatic you know, contributor analysis or root cause analysis for where those failures are happening now. And that then is turned into a real-time predictive quality score that allows people to both prevent quality issues from happening, but more importantly, tune the process in real time so that you can, with less risk, increase the output. And that's really important in the industries that you serve, because unlike making a cell phone, it's not like you can see each product as it comes off the line. You're usually working with customers who have these multi-hour batch processes. So if there's an issue, you've made a lot of the product before you've discovered it, correct? Exactly. And that's where, you know, if you have to take a sample, you run it to a lab, you find out many hours later that it was bad, it leads to people running processes very conservatively because the opportunity cost of a you know more efficient process is smaller than the cost of failure if you mess up. But if you know in real time how you're doing and you know how speed has an inverse effect on quality, but other metrics will counteract that, you can tune the process with much less risk. And you can see you know, easily opportunities to increase output 10, 15%. And if you know in real time, if you're making good or bad products or not, that you know, opportunity cost all of a sudden is a lot more appealing. Got it. Yes. It's why I don't mess with my Christmas cookie recipe when I'm making batches of like 80 for my friends and family, but I will test out new recipes at other times. Okay. Let's talk about the problems facing your customers, because I think when I talk to people about manufacturing, their biggest issues are usually one, finding employees. This is very hard. Yeah. Um, And two, right now it is figuring out what to make, and then getting the raw materials in to make it. So I would love to talk about how you're helping with either one or both of those issues. Yeah, I'd I'd love to dive into both. I'll start with the raw materials one. Unfortunately, we can't make raw materials magically appear. (laughs) But what we see everyone doing is increase the level of recycled material that they're using. And they're doing it as a necessity right now because that might be easier to get. But it's also more of a long-term trend where every manufacturer has sustainability goals and they want to increase the amount of recycled material that they use. But when you do that, you need to change the process 
in order to maintain the same level of output or the same quality. Because the process will change when you increase non-virgin material. So we help customers analyze how the different material actually impacts the process so that they can create better real-time instructions or better real-time alerts and real-time guidance on how should I make this process run now with 30% recycled material instead of 10. Can you give an example of this? Well, the one example, we had one customer who they had struggled for a really long time because they actually didn't know to what degree the amount of recycled material did have an impact on their processing. They just had a feeling. But the transparency and the guided analytics proved the difference between the different quality grades, and we could give them specific process metric recommendations for you know different grades that would yield a high quality outcome. So you know, depending on the mix, the new instructions to the operators are different on temperature profiles and speeds while still making the same quality output. I think, you know, when it comes to the supply chain issues, and a lot of our customers are in the you know construction industry or, or packaging industry, and they have a lot of excess demand. So any excess output is sold. So that's definitely a huge focus for all of our customers. I was at a dinner with three of them a couple of weeks ago, and they all said that they had the biggest years ever last year. But the one thing keeping them up at night was workforce. And I think that's true for all of manufacturing. And one thing that I find really interesting there is because you know we've, we've worked with a lot of different industries for many years now, and everyone says the same thing. Our process is more of an art than a science. And I used to always say, let's try to add a little bit more science to it with the data and analytics. But I've realized that that's the wrong kind of approach or messaging to take. The right approach is let's make it easier to become artists. Because right now, everyone is struggling because, you know, Amazon is offering $30 an hour with benefits and flexible hours. And for manufacturing, it's extremely hard to compete on that salary. But it's even more difficult to compete on the flexible hours because the jobs are difficult. It is not easy to be an operator. A lot of these processes are complex. And there's a German word that I love, which is finger fingerspitzgefühl, which translates to fingertip feel. And you know, operators need to learn this, you know, domain knowledge through experience for many years before they become, you know, the artists and can really own the process. And this then translates into, you know, health and safety risks as well. I've heard stories from customers where they see, you know, huge differences in injury risk depending on experience level because they're in a high stress environment that is, you know, a 24-7 operation coupled with a low control environment where especially new people on the job don't feel like they have the means to really control the process and their output and their performance which means that they make riskier decisions and they risk, you know, their health. I think that's actually a really interesting point because a lot of the people in IT look at bringing in more data analytics to any sort of workforce process, any any Amazon bringing in data to optimize like warehouse employees and even things in white collar offices where you have like sensors to track who's at their desk and that sort of thing. People look at that as a very intrusive and very productivity oriented. But in a lot of the industrial applications, the sensors and the data analytics are brought in, yes, to help with productivity, but also with a high focus on safety and ensuring that people are doing things well in like to prevent RSI or to prevent, you know, explosions, that sort of thing. So I think it's kind of worth talking a little bit about how the industrial world is choosing to use some of this data. And so in my mind, you really got two main themes there. One is decrease the barrier of entry to these jobs, make it easier to learn the process by getting more real-time instructions and guidance on how to make the product as good as possible. Make someone you know, reasonably new on the job perform like an artist who's been there for many years. And it's gonna be way easier to do that with digital tools and you know, data to give them proper guidance 
that also gives them more control because if they have, and you know, people always talk about how it's difficult to attract young people to the manufacturing industry. Well, the thing that young people want is more control over their performance and they want to have a measurable impact. And all these tools cater very well to that. And especially if you can, you know, translate the domain knowledge from those, you know, I'm going to keep calling them artists who's been there for many years, who might be retiring at some point, you know, they have a vested interest in perpetuating their craft so that they can translate and train those younger people who can come in and just perform like they can, but much, much faster. And if you can execute that, then you could, you know, see the manufacturing industry going towards both every employee being more valuable because they can impact more output, but also it might be easier to create more flexible schedules because the job is easier. It's like automating tasks, decreasing the barrier of entry doesn't remove the need for the job. It actually makes the person more valuable. So you might be able to compete with Amazon. Okay. So let's talk about optimization because that's what we're talking. You're talking about creating this this quality score or predictive quality score. And I feel like there are so many priorities right now. There's sustainability priorities, safety, again, ROI and productivity. Just there are so many options out there and this isn't magic. This is... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is science. So how are your customers prioritizing? And then when they shift priorities, how long does it take to retrain or rejigger the system? I'll start on the beginning of that question and say that I look at it as there's adherence and improvement. And a lot of people don't have perfect adherence. There's a lot of variability between different shifts, different lines, different operators. So even before you start going down more advanced you know, use cases as prescriptive optimization or predictive quality, just looking at the adherence and saying, where is the biggest variance between operator performance, between product performance or line performance or supplier material performance, that is usually a very fast way to optimize what is currently going on. And I always like to say that digital investments like we help our customers with, it doesn't give you any new goals. It only allows you to reach or exceed your goals faster. So the prioritization should come from the customer or the manufacturer knowing what they want to do. As an example, if we just take increased capacity as the number one goal right now. After that, the transparency of is it performance, quality, or utilization, if we just take the OEE lens, one of those is going to have a bigger impact. And the transparency in the data that is probably locked in different silos right now kind of unveils the answer. So it's less about people looking for use cases because then you're more like a hammer looking for a nail. You're really just looking for increasing the output and finding the fastest way to get there. But then, you know, as soon as you start removing all the low hanging fruit, you have to go to more and more advanced use cases. And that's where, whether it's predictive quality, which is just one part of what we do, or prescriptive optimization and recommendations on you know, new settings to increase output, it really depends on what's gonna move the needle the most. That's why even though we get judged on our ability to impact OEE, what I like to think of it more is the long-term impact is how do we help those people find problems and solve problems faster? Because whether it is utilization, performance, or quality, it all comes down to those people, engineers and operations folks and operators finding the important thing and executing on it as fast as possible. So a lot of this comes down to lean principles of automating non-value added tasks in data collection, in analysis, or in communication, and then augmenting whatever can't be automated. Okay. And what about how long it takes to reprioritize or what does that process look like? I don't really think of it as much of a time or lead time to reprioritize because whether it is predictive quality, since we take a productized approach on it, and it's not, you know, consulting engagements, whether they want to look at predictive quality, or look at utilization, or look at performance, one day to the next, it's all there in the product. And so if you look at a new customer, 
who wants to see predictive quality for the first time, that might require three to six months of historical data to run through the automated training workflow of these models. But it doesn't require marginal effort to go from one use case to the next because it's there through the integration, really. Got it. All right. Well, Willem, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. I really appreciate the chance to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that concludes this week's episode of the Internet of Things podcast. Please join us next Thursday and don't forget to subscribe. And if you can't get enough IoT news, I would love for you to sign up at www.stacyoniot.com for our weekly IoT newsletter, where we explain all kinds of things that we don't even get to on the show. Once again, thank you for listening and please subscribe. Thank you.